All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Tara Bushnow with the Upper Guadalupe River Authority and welcome to this part three of our Streamside Landowner Workshop Series. So this series has been brought to you as a partnership among UGRA and the Hill Country Alliance, as well as Plateau Land and Wildlife Management and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And it's been a bit of a different format than we've done uh, for other landowner seminars in the past. Daniel Oppenheimer of Hill Country Alliance kind of pitched this idea about a year and a half ago that he wanted to have a series of workshops that really started to, to build connections with the landowners that lasted longer than that one day of the workshop. Um, we also wanted to be able to give some practice with implementing some of the hand-on techniques that would, would help to restore and preserve riparian areas. Um, in the Guadalupe River Basin and in other areas in Central Texas. So we're excited that several of you have been landowners that have joined us for all three parts of this series uh, back when we first met in November of 2019. And um, we welcome everybody that we're kind of meeting for the first time. So maybe a little bit of a silver lining to not being able to meet in person today is that we are able to invite a wider range of landowners and have a, have a bigger group get together to talk about this. Uh, so just a couple of logistics before we get started. Um, I mentioned that we'd like everyone to remain muted with your video off until that last QA section, and that's going to help everybody to have a better experience with their connection speeds. I'd also like you to please use the chat feature to send questions during the webinar. We have a lot of the questions that you submitted when you registered, and then we can do our best to incorporate those additional questions uh, when we get to those sections of the agenda. So you can find that chat feature is on the Zoom menu bar again. And if you'll send those questions to me, it says Tara Bushno, UGRA host, um, that's who you want to send your questions to. So I'm just gonna go over our agenda uh, for today. So we're gonna, Daniel is gonna, Daniel Oppenheimer from Hill Country Alliance is going to kick us off with just a little bit of a recap of where, where we have been so far. Um, and then we're going to watch a video that was filmed in early August uh, at Roberts Ranch that is going to show the progress of some of those plantings. And that's going to be uh, featuring Daniel as well as Ryan McGillicuddy with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and Steve Nelly, who may be retired from NRCS, but you know, works tirelessly to share his passion for land management and specifically to, uh, for management of riparian areas. Uh, then we're gonna take a little bit, uh, Steve and Ryan will also have some photo points to share with you as well, in addition to the video. Then we'll take a little bit of a break from the presentations and discuss some of your questions that you submitted during the, during the registration and our panelists are going to, to field those answers for you. Then we're going to hear from Shane Kiefer with Plateau Land and Wildlife Management, talk about finding the right balance and specifically about targeted you know, grow zone areas. And then our Daniel is going to wrap, a, wrap this all up for us and talk about the next steps for this group and how we might uh, continue these conversations in the future. And then we'll have some time at the end uh, for additional questions. So again, thank you very much to all of our partners in this workshop series, Hill Country Alliance, Plateau Land and Wildlife Management, Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, and UGRA. And also a special thank you to Texas Master Naturalist, whose volunteers monitored the plantings at Roberts Ranch and photo documented them during the last seven months. And um, a big thank you to YMCA Roberts Ranch for inviting us out to your creek and letting us use that area as a great uh, field site to, to really learn, learn together. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, hand it over to Daniel Oppenheimer of Hill Country Alliance. Good morning, everybody. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? You look good. All right. So Tara, thanks for kicking things off. Again, I just want to take a couple of minutes to put today into context. Um, so as Tara mentioned, we have, uh, Tara and Ryan and Steve and Shane and I, we've all hosted one day workshops where you get out there with some folks, you share some information and perhaps you never see or hear from them again. And, and you don't know how effective you were in sharing information and, and what positive outcomes, if any, uh, were yielded from that, uh, interaction. And so based on those past experiences, we decided rather than this one and done approach to build a three part series. So whether you're here 
um, and you've been here for all the previous sections or this is your first time, we're glad you're with us. We're gonna have a refresher for everyone so you're all on the same page. And I, again, I just wanna give a quick overview of where we've been. So with this new series, we're trying to really build relationships uh, from landowner to landowner, as well as uh, the landowners and, and the great group of practitioners that we've assembled today, so that we're, we're building capacity and we're supporting one another to really help uh, achieve good riparian health and function. So how do we start? We started back in November at the UGRA Auditorium in Kerrville. Uh, we went through the basics of riparian systems, and then we went uh, on a walk along the river in town just to get a, a close up look at riparian areas and, and really underscore some of the principles and, and the basics that we had discussed in the auditorium. So that was back in November. And then uh, in February at the beginning, beginning of this year, we went out to Roberts Ranch. And again, we did a quick refresher from the previous session. And we talked about different ways that we can help kickstart the recovery of riparian systems. And we learned, uh, we did some really great hands-on experiential learning, uh, demonstrated a number of different planting techniques, which we'll talk about today. And then part three, we were supposed to be back at this beautiful spot uh, at Roberts Ranch, uh, but given some of the concerns around COVID-19, we decided it would not be a great idea to get 55 folks uh, up close together in one spot. And so instead today, we are on Zoom. Uh, so thank y'all for joining us in the comforts of your home. While, again, we wish we could have taken you back out to the ranch, we're glad that we can still connect with you, uh, albeit online. So what we did, given that we knew this would be a Zoom um, session for part three instead of out and about, we wanted to still bring Robert's Ranch to y'all. So Steve and Ryan and I went out a few weeks ago um, to look at how those plantings have shaped up through the growing season. And we made a little video um, and Ryan's put a lot of great work into editing that to make it presentable. Again, we're gonna show that in just a moment. Please uh, turn off your video settings if you haven't already, close out those other apps so that uh, you're optimizing your bandwidth and, and we can uh, all have a good experience watching this video. Again, the goal of this series is that we're building relationships we're encouraging you and hoping that you'll reach out to us. We'll all share our contact information throughout this morning. Here's mine. Uh, in a few months, we're gonna reach out to y'all and, and see if you have any questions. Uh, we're gonna send you a survey to see how effective we were. Ha have you uh, incorporated some of the lessons and learning from this series? If so, what does that look like on your place? So again, this is an ongoing conversation and, and we hope you'll continue to engage with us um, in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tara. And uh, again, we're really glad that y'all could join us this morning. And uh, we'll have a great discussion uh, after the video and the presentations. So again, welcome. And we're excited to learn with y'all today. Excellent. All right, Travis is going to go ahead and share his screen to get the video going. And I'll just give a little Zoom tip if um, when the presenters are screen sharing, and you see the videos of everybody else off to the side of your screen, um, you have the ability to control that on your end by either minimizing all of them or by just having the speaker show. And you can move that little video box around your screen if it, so don't worry about if it's blocking um, some of the content because you can move that around. So play around with that feature if, if um, that's preventing you from seeing the whole screen. Okay. Um, and. Daniel gave some good tips about the video quality. We'll also have the link to watch this video on YouTube and that will have great resolution and we'll send that out again in the wrap up email too. Go ahead, Travis. Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Daniel Oppenheimer. I'm the land program manager at the Hill Country Alliance. Happy to welcome you here to the YMCA's Roberts Ranch. We're down near Comfort, Texas on a tributary of the Guadalupe River. And today we're here to talk to you about riparian areas. What are they? Why do they matter? And how can we be good stewards to riparian areas in our hill country creeks and rivers? So again, we're happy to have you out here and uh, hope you learn a thing or two. Thanks. 
Hello, my name is Steve Nelly, and we're here at the Roberts Ranch to uh, discuss riparian areas and why they're important. So, by way of review, a riparian area is simply that narrow strip of land that lies adjacent to and parallel creeks and rivers. And uh, this little strip of land may only make up 1% of the landscape, but it's far more important ecologically and has some functions that are really important that landowners understand. So a, a properly functioning riparian area would be one that is very thickly vegetated with native plants, a diversity of native plants. And the reason we need that kind of uh, plant density and plant amount is to think about when these creeks get on a rise and the water fills the channel and there's a lot of energy coming down these creeks that th the vegetation actually dissipates the energy of the running water. It slows the water down. It's not as erosive. And in fact, the vegetation along a riparian area slows the water down enough that it traps sediment and it begins to build up soil in the adjacent areas. So what that does over time is when you slow down the floodwaters with vegetation, it gives more time for those waters to sink back into the valley, back into the floodplain. So a landowner can actually make his creek wetter by proper management of the riparian area. This riparian area is in the process of healing up. It had been uh, severely grazed previously. The cattle have been removed, which was the most important thing that can be done, removed temporarily. And what we're going to show today is two methods of restoration. One would be more passive restoration, and one is more active. So on this particular location, you're gonna see that the creek channel is dry. It's a seasonal creek. There's still a water table underneath our feet that's sustaining all of this vegetation. But as time goes on, this vegetation is gonna get thicker and thicker and taller and taller. And it's happening, it's happening naturally, but we can also uh, accelerate that restoration and that recovery by planting appropriate native species. And so we have planted uh, six or eight uh, different species here in an effort simply to jumpstart and try to um, accelerate this natural healing process. So Steve mentioned again, these riparian areas, they're resilient and they can heal themselves on their own, but there might be certain occasions where we wanna help jumpstart their recovery. So one of the methods we can use uh, is called cuttings. There are certain tree species like sycamore and black willow and box elder where you can take a cutting. Now this is a method we do not right now in the heat of August, but during the dormant season. Once all these trees have lost their leaves, you come out again for certain species like a box elder, a black willow or a sycamore, and you wanna find a nice young branch about the, this size, several feet in length, about the thickness of your thumb, smooth bark. You don't want a big branch with a lot of rough bark. And you just take a little cutting um, and then you need to find a spot near the water. These species like to be near water. And um, you might need a rock bar and you wanna get these in the ground about one and a half to two feet so that they're really well into the soil. When they start growing roots, they're finding that groundwater. And then when you have a flood, they're in the ground deep enough to where they're not just going to get knocked back out. So we're going to go take a look at a few of those examples. All right. So again, we use three different tree and shrub species for cuttings. With these species, they're very desirable. Uh, deer love to browse on them. Livestock love to browse on them. So you plant them in a pretty heavy density, knowing you're going to have some uh, impact from those uh, browsers. And so Here's a, the black willow. You can see it, it struggled a little bit with the heat, but it's still got some good green growth on it. We planted around 100 of these. Here's a live one that's hanging in there doing pretty darn well. 
If you look up, this is just a little higher up on the terrace. This is one that uh, did not make it through the growing season. And so again, we planted about a hundred of these black willow and these are smaller than we would typically plant. Usually you'd like one that's again about the thickness of your thumb, a few feet high that can hopefully get above the browse height faster. And um, of the hundred or so black willows that we planted, we had about a 50% survival, um, which between the drought and browsers, we're pretty darn happy with. So now we're gonna go down and look at a couple other species. All right, so again, here's another example of one of those uh, little black willow cuttings that we planted that's hanging on, doing pretty happy, maybe a little dry. Uh, this is the second species of cuttings that we planted. This is a sycamore tree, and we had uh, about 70% survival of sycamore cuttings uh, that made it through the, the dry season. We had a couple of hot, dry summer months, not a drought, but still noticeably hot and dry. Uh, we had some browse on some of the cuttings up above, but again, 70% survival, we're pretty darn happy with. All right, so again, we talked about the black willow, had about 50% survival, the sycamore, about 70% survival. The third species of cuttings that we used was the box elder tree. Um, and just as with the sycamores, we had about 70% survival. So you can see here's a few happy ones that are doing just fine in the riparian area. Here's an example of one that looks like it never quite um, got going. Um, again, a couple of hot dry months, uh, some browse from, uh, from native deer, exotic species, uh, probably impacted some of these cuttings. But overall, this method, um, it's very simple. If you have some of these species on your property, all you need to do is flag them during the growing season when they've got their leaves and you can easily identify them. Go back out in the winter time. Once they're dormant, they're less stressed out um, and you find those trees that you flag. Again, cut off some cuttings about the thickness of your thumb, get them in the ground, give them a little water and um, you should be good to go. Thanks. There. I'm Ryan McGillicuddy. I'm a conservation biologist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about reseeding, which is another method that we can use to jumpstart the restoration process. Um, before we uh, show you some of our results, we'll talk a little bit about some of the methods that we used at this particular location. Uh, really, the first thing that you're going to want to think of when uh, reseeding is your location. So are we on bare ground? Are we close to the creek? Are we a little bit higher up on the bank? And that's gonna help you determine what seed mix you choose. If you're somewhere like on this uh, gravel bar that doesn't have much nutrient matter, it's a little bit more nutrient deprived, it might get a little bit more full sun, you're gonna wanna choose uh, a grass uh, that doesn't mind that environment, something like a switchgrass or a bushy blue stem or an eastern gamma. If you're in the shade a little bit higher up, things that might like to be there are things like southwestern bristlegrass or um, switchgrass will do okay in there, but things like inland sea oats and uh, wild rye will do better in that environment. So once you've selected your seed mix, the next thing people most often worry about is timing. Uh, things like wildflowers, uh, forbs, tend to want to be seeded and germinate in the fall, uh, or they'll germinate the, the following spring. Uh, but planted in the fall, uh, our grasses, most often uh, we're want, gonna wanna do the, uh, the seeding in the late winter, early spring. Now we used a mix here of 36 different uh, species um, that uh, include wildflowers and grasses. So a mix like this can really be planted any time in that cool season between about October and February or early March. Now the seeding method is pretty easy. You can do it a couple different ways. You can simply broadcast by hand like you're feeding chickens and just tossing it on the ground. Uh, or if you want to be a little bit more methodical and have more even distribution, you can use a seed spreader like this, which just broadcasts it evenly across the area. Now, following the seeding, you're going to want to make sure that you work the seed into the soil a little bit. Now, you don't want to bury it too much because a seed really can't germinate if it's buried more than about twice uh, the depth 
as the seed is wide. And if you notice, some of our native seed is very, very small. So you're gonna wanna just gently rake it in with the back of a rake after you've uh, um, uh, uh, spread it on the ground. So just gently moving over it to just add a little bit of a, uh, 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 a soil layer over it. You can do that with the back of a, a cedar bough, something like that, or you can simply even just walk over the area and step it in. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the methods for seeding. Um, now let's go look at some of the results. So at Roberts Ranch, uh, we have had a what we call a deferment. So cattle have been pulled off uh, for about a year to give uh, the, the grasses, the vegetation, the opportunity to get jump started again uh, so we can increase uh, diversity and vigor of the vegetation. So we mentioned that we've done some seeding, but there is an active seed bank here as well. You can see mature grasses like this Lindheimer muley, uh, like these Indian grasses here that were already in place that are gonna contribute to the seed bank uh, now that we have uh, time for uh, the area to rest out of grazing. So cattle will come back about a year from now uh, and perhaps longer, and we will have increased the, the forage, the palatability for those animals. Um, so that's part of the goal of what we've done here. Um, but what happens is we've added some seed to these bare areas uh, to just increase that diversity, uh, increase the plant matter. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna start trapping sediment, starting to colonize and build this floodplain. Like Steve mentioned earlier, that allows water to infiltrate and it stores water like a sponge, holding on to water longer throughout the year. So we've got increased forage, we've got increased water storage, and we've got increased um, stability of our stream bank. So those are our values. Um, now, if we talk for a moment about hindrances, uh, those would be things like overgrazing, uh, things like exotic uh, species like axis deer or an overabundance of whitetail deer that might come in and prohibit some of these plants from really growing up to their true potential, to their vigor. Uh, so we wanna make sure that things like that are well managed, uh, you know, managed thoughtfully. Um, so if we look at the results of what our seeding is to fill in some of the gaps, you can see that all over this bare gravel bank, uh, this gravel bar, we see a bunch of different plants that are about three inches high. We seeded this whole area and you can see that we're starting to get a pretty good start uh, on all these plants. Now we did have a very dry uh, summer that inhibited the growth uh, a little bit, but we got a little bit of rain um, just last week that's, uh, that's, that's helped this stuff green up a little bit. So overall, we are very pleased with the results of our uh, seeding efforts combined with the transplants and the stakes. I think we're off to a very good start. We're going to now look at the third method of, of our recovery, restoration that we attempted here on this uh, tributary of, of uh, Cypress Creek. This, at this location, we planted from potted potted material that had been grown by a grower, uh, five different riparian species. We planted emery sedge, spike rush, scouring rush, switchgrass, and eastern gamma grass. And we had anywhere from uh, around 20 to 25 of those. And we had this group of volunteers, totally unskilled labor. All you need is a shovel and a willingness to work. So we took these one gallon potted materials. In many cases, we would take a hatchet and we may split up a one gallon pot into three separate plants. And they just took their shovels and you can see this rocky. It's not easy digging, but there's places all along here that uh, were suitable for planting of riparian species. Three of the species we planted right along the water line remind you that there was running water in this creek at the time we planted even though it's dried up now so three of the species we planted right down here where we know it was wet two of the species we planted up on this higher bench which is approximately two to three feet higher uh, all in all we were pleased with the success we had uh, 50 percent survival on emery sedge i'll show you in a minute we had about 60% survival on spike rush. We had an 85% survival on scouring rush. And then we believe that about a 50% survival on both the switchgrass and the eastern gamma grass. So all in all, we're pleased. We were fortunate that we had some favorable rains this spring. And that's always gonna be a large factor in success is 
what kind of range you get. You don't want too much, you don't want too little. So we consider this a pretty successful project. We want to look at some of the species that we planted and the success we had. So this first example, just to give you an idea of what scouring rush looks like, it's actually a type of fern that it grows naturally in along many riparian areas. It's got good strong roots. It's rated as a seven on a scale of one to 10 on root strength. And this one plant is going to expand in diameter as, as the time goes on. So this is scouring rush. And then right next to it, this entire clump here where my stick is, is at, is called spike rush. It's a type of sedge, and you can see that there's probably a, at least a couple of plantings here that did very well. It's starting to spread. It weeps over into the channel. And what's interesting about this particular species of spike rush is that where the leaf tips arch over, and if they touch wet ground, they begin to take root. So we can almost expect exponential increase from spike rush. There's several plants right here. One, two, three. And then the, this, the, plant, the, the grass that's back behind this scouring rush, the kind of a bluish gray color is some of the uh, switchgrass that we planted. There's also some natural switchgrass in here, so it's impossible to say which ones of these we planted and which came up naturally. The next plant we want to feature is this one right here at the tip of my stick. This is emery sedge. And this is one of the most strong-rooted, valuable riparian plants that we have in the whole hill country. It's a sedge that produces extremely strong roots. It's rated a nine on a scale of one to 10. And here it, here it is again, next to a switchgrass. This plant is going to spread by rhizomes. So even though it's just one isolated clump right now, we expect it to expand both directions along the water line. Well, everybody, thanks again for joining us down at uh, YMCA's Roberts Ranch. Again, we're here today to talk about riparian areas, what they are, why they matter, when they function properly, all the tremendous values that they can provide to us, to livestock, to fish, and to wildlife. Um, again, these are resilient systems. They can heal up on their own, but to do that, we have to manage the stressor. And you're gonna need to go out to your own property, think about what those stressors might be. Perhaps it's excessive mowing, perhaps it's excessive grazing, Perhaps it's the high number of native whitetail or exotic deer species like axis deer. Understanding your riparian system and how to manage those stressors is critical to success. And then once you have that understanding, you can help jumpstart the system by using some of the planting methods that we've discussed today. One thing we didn't mention is with some of these plantings, one thing you can do to protect them from grazers, from browsers, is to use uh, either caging material or you can just take some cedar slash you can form a donut around your plantings and that's going to deter certain herbivores for wanting to get their mouth in there to start nibbling on your plantings so again thanks for joining us uh, i want to thank some of our partners who made this whole process uh, possible I want to thank the ymca roberts ranch the Upper Guadalupe River Authority. If you're a landowner in Kerr County and have questions about taking care of the river or taking care of the natural resources, make sure you get in touch with them. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Plateau Land and Wildlife Management, and all the great volunteers at Texas Master Naturalists. If you'd like to learn more 
Um, there's a lot of resources. The partners I just mentioned, uh, if you email me at daniel at hillcountryalliance.org, again, daniel at hillcountryalliance.org, uh, we can send you uh, the packet, which gives a nice distillation of these planting methods we've discussed today. With that, again, we appreciate your time and all your stewardship. Thanks. Excellent, thank you very much. So um, Travis is gonna stop sharing his screen and we will get Steve and Ryan loaded up for um, the next presentation. And while they're doing that, I just wanted to mention the chat feature again. If you have any questions that you think of just as the presenters are talking, please feel free um, to send them. I'm gonna send a message to everybody now in the chat. And all you need to do is reply to that and um, send your questions. So Steve or Ryan, whichever one of you is going to share your screen for the um, photo points, go right ahead. Sure, I'll start it off. Um, can everybody see that okay? Tarek, is it coming through? Yes, that looks good. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate y'all's continued participation and willingness to learn even in this, um, you know, uh, interesting time where we can't get together in person. Um, but, but again, thank you all. Um, just by way of review here, uh, we just talked about three different methods that we use to jumpstart riparian recovery and those were the uh, transplants, the cutting, and the seeding and we did them uh, in three different sections along the river so you could really delineate those areas and, and track the progress. So with that in mind we just want to um, you know stress the value of uh, monitoring and using photo points. So uh, you can establish uh, a set point from which a vantage point from which you take pictures and uh, you know seasonally throughout the year uh, you know a couple times a year or once every season take a picture and you can track the growth and that'll give you an idea of where you started because it is very easy to forget what it looked like uh, and how much progress has actually been made um, you know here we had uh, you can see the impacts of grazing uh, along this area it's relatively bare steve's here talking to the group about uh, putting some transplants in and um, you know, also what it can do is give you an idea of the different, the amount of diversity that you've uh, achieved. Um, so we've, you know, might have gone from just a handful of species to, um, you know, several dozen species. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna run through some of these photo points real quick. Uh, want to give um, special thanks to uh, Deborah Youngblood for uh, Texas Master Naturalist for returning out to the site and uh, providing us with these photo points. It's uh, invaluable and very much appreciated. Thank you, Deborah. So this is the transplant area, and we're just standing here to give scale. This is before seeding, um, you know, earlier in the winter. And you can see that we really, it is winter time, so you know, the vegetation has died back a little bit, but you really can see that there is a lack of vegetation growth, and that's directly due to the overgrazing. We do see some switchgrass here along the edges, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's heavily browsed uh, and or grazed. Steve here uh, instructing the group on how to install the transplants in this section. And uh, we mentioned in the video dividing them up with a hatchet. That's this process right here. So these came out of, you know, this, this one gallon containerized plant uh, plants, but you can, uh, you know, extend the coverage uh, of those plants by uh, dividing them up and then uh, planting them uh, along the uh, creek bed or the riparian zone. So this is where we were just standing and you can see in February, we've got these transplants installed. Uh, you can see them uh, put in here along the water's edge. And so now we're just kind of waiting for that rain uh, to come and uh, that growing season to, to begin and see what kind of uh, growth we get. So it's, again, pretty bare here. But you can see 
in just a short amount of time with a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, change in seasons and a little bit of rain, we start to get some growth. Now we didn't plant this whole area, we didn't see this whole area. So what this illustrates, uh, in addition to the value of planting, is the, uh, the importance of removing the source of disturbance to jumpstart that recovery. So grazing was taken off this property, uh, you know, with the intention of returning it rotationally at some point in the future, but we are jumpstarting this recovery process. So we do have this natural uh, passive recovery occurring at the same time that we installed those plants. Now, the value of installing the plants alongside this passive recovery is that we are jumpstarting it with a little bit older material, but we're also adding diversity. So those, uh, those plants will add that Eastern Gamma grass and uh, the, the scouring rush that was not there. We didn't see too much Eleocris or Emery sedge. So we're adding diversity and we're also, uh, diversity and we're also trying to get us about a year or two ahead. Uh, as far as the size of the plants go. Uh, ex uh, example of the cedar slash here that Daniel mentioned, protecting some of this young growth of the, uh, see some Eastern gamma grass in here. So this is still April. August, we can see, uh, you know, this was right after a, sh a short rain, but it, it was enough to green it up, but really not promote a lot of additional growth. This is primarily a lot of the growth that had taken uh, place up to June because we did have a very, very dry June and July at the site. So we can already see quite a bit of growth uh, with the transplants uh, uh, along the edge here and, um, and uh, up within that second terrace with the Eastern Gamma and the switchgrass. So the cuttings um, were the uh, second method uh, or that, that other method that we looked at in the video and you can see one of the willow sprigs here, a little bit smaller. Uh, than, than the other box elder and sycamore. So planting them along the edge here, either planting them deep enough to kind of get in touch, he said a foot to uh, two feet. You can see that's how far we're trying to put them down so they're getting in touch with this water table that's connected to the flow in the channel here. So February, 2020, uh, right after installation, uh, just a couple months later in April, you can already see them budding out. So that's because of their direct connection with the water table which is very important because they are going to start getting stressed by the heat. So we wanna get some of that early growth early in the season. August, that, uh, that water's gone, you know, but it has receded underground. These plants have gotten the opportunity to grow their roots, to chase that receding water table down and stay in connection. So we still see some pretty vigorous uh, leaf growth. Uh, the, these uh, box elders right here look pretty healthy and uh, that's because uh, of uh, the, the uh, successful installation. So we're pretty pleased with how those were able to fare the, uh, the, the stress of the summer. Seeding, this is that bare gravel bar that I was standing on in the video. Uh, you can really see just how bare it was. Um, and that's a uh, result of uh, some of the overgrazing and browsing. So the area that we planted is this area along this gravel bar. Now. Uh, we had some folks asking, why are we planting directly in the channel? Uh, really, we were. this is a, a gravel bar on the left of the channel. The main channel moves off to the right here and kind of snakes over this area. So we've got a widened uh, channel bed area here with some gravel deposits, but the main flow is directed off to the right. And so what we're doing with this seeding is really trying to stabilize uh, this loose aggregate material uh, right in here. So in May, we can see some sprigs starting to come up, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, this is uh, probably a result of both the native seed bank, but also uh, directly from our seeding efforts. July is starting to come up even more, helping with the shade from these, uh, from these sycamores, protecting them. And then in August, kind of inspecting closely, you can see we've got about three to six inches of growth. Uh, most of this is probably a direct result of that germination. You can see it really uh, nicely up in here, um, kind of starting to fill in. Now the difference between this area and where we saw that other passive restoration, uh, you know, occurring at that first site where the transplants were, we saw a lot of growth coming in on its own without the benefit of seeding. And uh, the reason that you see that there is because uh, there is a lot of more organic material in that area up on that higher terrace. So here we have a gravel bar that we're trying to stabilize. Um, a, a few things happen that kind of uh, inhibit the growth and germination of species in this area. There's not a lot of nutrients. There's not a lot of organic matter to, um, to uh, trap and store water and feed the roots of those germinating plants. 
So uh, you're going to get a little bit less success in this area, but what we are doing is jumpstarting that recovery. You can see that we're already starting to get some leaf matter that's going to become trapped and meshed with this, uh, with this sprouting vegetation, and it's going to create this feedback cycle where we're adding nutrient matter, stabilizing this, and uh, assimilating it all together, and uh, hopefully get that stabilized and uh, create a more sponge-like environment um, for retaining water and increasing base flows. So Steve is going to jump in with some uh, additional insights uh, about the plant specifically. Um, so uh, thanks again for, to Deb Youngblood for the photo series. I'll, I'll actually hold off on questions right now until uh, Steve's is done and, and we can answer those in tandem. I'll give you one quick question while Steve is sharing his screen. Um, can you just reiterate what is the best time of year to put in cuttings? For cuttings specifically, that's going to be uh, when they're going dormant. So in the uh, in the winter months, you can take those cuttings anywhere, uh, you know, from about November uh, to February is the, is the right time to install. So they're they're still alive. You know, you'll you'll see they've they've gone dormant and kind of look hard and brittle. But inside, if you once you take that cutting, you can still notice there uh, there's a lot of life inside there. And what that allows the plants to do is uh, they are focusing on their root growth at that time of year uh, and they are not, um, you know, because they, they don't have leaves on. So once they start getting leaves on, um, they're going to be putting a lot of their energy into leaf growth and not root growth. So if you plant too late in the season, you know, getting into March, April, uh, you can do cuttings, uh, but it might require a little bit more watering. Uh, and nursing along some irrigation because that's the time of year where they're going to be putting energy into leaf growth and, and you might not have as good a success rate. Great. All right, Steve, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, Tara, I want to make sure that you can hear me one and that the screen is up the way it needs to be. Yes, on both. Okay, very good. This is Steve Nelly here. So one aspect of riparian stewardship is understanding when a creek is messed up and understanding how can it be fixed how can it be repaired and so across the region across the hill country there still are quite a few creeks that are that are pretty messed up and they need uh, some different kind of management and fortunately these riparian areas their tendency is to want to heal themselves up naturally and that's just where the passive management comes in. If we will just change our management, stop doing certain things which hinder the recovery process, most of the time they're going to heal up very nicely beyond our dreams if we will just understand what it is that's hindering, or as Daniel said, uh, what are the stressors? And that's what we're seeing here is just natural recovery, natural restoration. You may have seen this list at a previous workshop. These are some of the activities which we mentioned which will promote riparian recovery. And a lot of these are somewhat passive, but all we're gonna talk about today is this one facet of how to promote riparian recovery by the planting of native uh, riparian vegetation. And so the what we're trying to demonstrate with this particular workshop is the planting of uh, various species that can jumpstart or hasten or augment the natural recovery. So you can purchase potted material from growers, and we have a lot of growers now that, that, are, that will produce uh, the right kinds of plants and the price is reasonable. So we can purchase material or you can dig your own material either way or both um, are acceptable methods to uh, plant in this riparian area. We're looking for species that have um, a high root mass, uh, strong roots, lots of roots that provide the stability we need to hold the banks together, to dissipate energy, and to be able to resist erosion. And it's really pretty amazing to think that a plant that starts out like this can end up something like that within just a year or a year and a half. The growth rate is phenomenal. 
because again, we have that water table that's sustaining growth. Even if it's dry, we can have this kind of uh, impressive growth. Always choose species that are native to the site. That doesn't merely mean that they're native to the Edwards Plateau. It needs to be plants that are native to the site because not all riparian areas are the same. So you have to do some homework and to figure out what is actually native and natural to this particular site. That's an important step and we can help you in that if you need some assistance ever. It's good to choose at least some plants which spread by rhizomes. And you can see that illustrated here, how one plant becomes two, three, four, five plants by the expansion of the root system. And so we get that exponential growth and spreading. These are the plants that we transplanted. They've already been mentioned. I'll just put them up there so for a reminder. Planted in February. Uh, on the Roberts Ranch on Cypress Creek. Just a little bit about these plants. Emery sedge is one of the very strongest and most desirable riparian plants of the region. The nine is the stability rating, which has already been mentioned on a scale of one to 10, very strong rooted plant. And on the left, you see, <clears throat> you see this bank of Emery sedge, which is uh, very mature and very continuous providing very strong uh, rooting strength. And there's just a, a example of, of the roots and the rhizomes. Like I say, you can dig your own and subdivide it and plant it. Here's the scouring rush, rated a seven, pretty strong. Anything that's rated seven or higher is generally considered a strong stabilizing species. There's the spike rush, which has been mentioned. That one clump expanding out in all directions. And even though it doesn't have the strongest roots, look at the density of roots. One study in Arizona showed that there were 18 miles of root in spike rush per every cubic foot of soil. So that's really pretty hard to imagine. And it is one of the plants that uh, spreads by rhizomes and again you can see that that's really just one plant with many interconnected plants from that rhizomatous root system. So we really encourage choosing of plants that spread by rhizomes. Switchgrass, very strong rooted stabilizer rated a nine. Can't say enough good things about switchgrass. It's perhaps one of the top three or four important riparian grasses in the region. Very, very strong uh, root systems which hold together, which dissipate energy, which hold banks and resist erosion, even during some of the flash floods we get. You can see that this switchgrass was grown in a container, otherwise the roots would have been much, much deeper. But that's a pretty impressive root density. Again, holding those banks together, especially during the high flow flash foot events. And then the, Emory, the Eastern Gamma Grass also rated a nine. Some of the growers have mentioned that when they try to grow Eastern Gamma Grass in a pot, that they have to watch out because the, the roots will actually break the pot apart and the pot can't even contain uh, the root system. So several growers have mentioned that. There are some species we could have planted, which we didn't in, in this case, but Maximian sunflowers are very desirable fl fall flowering uh, perennial plant with a good strong root system. You can dig your own, you can seed it. Uh, this clump could, could have been divided two or three ways to provide uh, several plants. Sawgrass is another one we could have planted. Uh, look at the stability rating, nine or 10, somewhere in that range, about as strong as you get. There's what the seed head looks like. And um, there's the system of rhizomes. This particular photo was taken on the Blanco River only two weeks after the great flood. And yet that bank of sawgrass stood up to that, to that tremendous and horrible flood. So it's a strong rooted plant is the point. So on back to Roberts Ranch and the site, we identified two different planting zones. We planted some of the species right at the waterline 
at or near the water line, green line showing that. And we planted other plants on that first bench. That's the floodplain where everyone is standing. That's that first bench. That's the floodplain. That's where the gets during these high flow events. When we get a flash flood three or four or five inches overnight, the water is definitely spreading out where everyone is standing and that needs to be well vegetated. So at the water line, we planted the wetland plants, the spike rush, the scouring rush, and the emery sedge. On the first bench, we planted the switchgrass and the eastern gamma grass. There's, all, there's also Lenheimer's muley growing up there naturally. So two planting zones, you, you want to plant the species where they belong in the system. There's the potted, there's the material that we used on that day. Um, there's the chopping up of those potted material into several different subdivisions. It just depends on how much money you want to spend and how large a plant you want to plant. Again, it doesn't take a lot of uh, skill. It just takes people willing to work and get a little bit muddy. And there you see the hole has been dug. They're about to plant the um, emery sedge. There's where scouring rush has already been planted. And so these volunteers did a really good job, worked hard. We planted about 100 uh, plants in a matter of really 30 or 45 minutes. Work went pretty well. And again, you see here, just it takes willingness to work. We have uh, one group planting right along the water line. Again, that's the spike rush, the emery sedge, and the scouring rush. And we have another group planting up on that first bench, that floodplain bench. That would be the switchgrass and the eastern gamma grass. Several days after we planted, some volunteers came out and chopped some cedar branches, piled them up around the plants to deter the deer from uh, grazing them too early. And that's really pretty important. Uh, it's not absolutely essential, but we think it gives a little bit better chance of success. It also provides a little bit of shade and a little bit of, of protection. So we, we recommend that, that, especially where the deer uh, white tail or axis population is high, or audads or anything like that. Here's the emery sedge, fast forward six months after we planted it. That's a pretty impressive plant. Remember that we chopped these plants up into several uh, different sections. There's another one. It was at the edge of the channel in February. Emery sedge in the center, spike rush uh, to the right of my hat. Again, scouring rush, impressive growth for such a dry summer. Spike rush at the bottom. We're adding that diversity that Daniel and uh, Ryan talked about. There's the success rate. It's already been talked about, but uh, we, we all things considered, we're very happy with the success of this. You don't expect 100% survival or even 80%, but if you can get 40 to 60% survival on these, uh, you should probably consider that successful. And so again, the channel's dry, but the water table is there to sustain what was planted, a little bit of recent rain, and that riparian area is healing up very rapidly. That's a pretty darn good condition riparian area, and it's only gonna get better in the uh, months and years ahead. This picture and the next are very important to illustrate, it's already been mentioned that the area had been grazed substantially. This is what it looked like in February. Uh, you can see the impact of the grazing. Exact same location, illustrating the importance of photo points. Exact same location six months later. So let me toggle back and forth. February, you can see the tree branch crossing the screen. August, six months, a hot, dry summer. 90% of what you see there is the result of natural regeneration, the effects of suspending livestock grazing for a period of time, maybe one or two years. Uh, so the Roberts Ranch did 
what was necessary to um, hasten the natural recovery of this riparian area. One more time, February, August, same location. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So all in all, we're happy with it. Um, and I'll just end by saying thank you to the volunteers that did the work and thank you to Roberts Ranch for allowing us to use your section of Creek as a demonstration. I think it's been very valuable uh, and I always learn something new when I go out to a Creek like that. So that's the last of this Tara. I'm going to stop the screen share. Excellent. That was great. I think those last couple of pictures really, really said it all. Very impressive. Um, so now we're going to take a little bit of time to field some of the questions that you submitted during the registration when you registered for the for the seminar. So the, a lot of you had questions about proper management of invasive species in riparian areas. And so I'm gonna to go to Steve, Shane, and Ryan for this one. So if you want, you can turn your video on, the, those presenters can turn their video on to answer, or if you wanna just answer verbally, that's fine too. Um, so Steve, I kinda of want you to talk first about what are some of the common invasive plant species that we see, and they are still contributing to the riparian area. So what might their role be? in the riparian area, even though they are invasive? Yes, well, there's uh, a dozen or so. We, we tend to call them invasive species, but it could be uh, that we're talking about non-native species that were not here originally, and they have made their way uh, to United States, into Texas, to our creeks. And we have to remember this, that the creeks do not care what the geographic origin of the plants are that are stabilizing those banks. So we want to look really more at the function of the plant. How strong rooted is it? Is it performing some beneficial services uh, by providing dense, deep roots that slow down the water? And so we don't want to overreact to non-native plants, automatically just declaring war on them, trying to kill them. We all prefer native plants, absolutely. We all prefer the native species, but there's going to be cases you're going to see on every creek where there are some non-native plants. Perhaps you want to call them invasive plants. That's a little bit of a emotion-laden term. We kind of have to be a little bit careful about uh, portraying a plant as evil. Uh, but there's a place for managing these plants, but do it thoughtfully. Do it with some forethought and thinking through what's actually happening. And if you're too aggressive with the removal and the management of non-native plants, you can actually do more harm than good. So be careful and do it in stages perhaps instead of just all at once. I think Ryan and Shane may have some other uh, aspects of that, but what I want to share with you is be aware of what positive things they may be doing on the creek and Great. don't focus exclusively on whether they're native or exotic. Yes, I think we said if you're, you know, any plant is better than bare ground. And if they have roots, you know, especially in the early stages of restoration, then they can be, they're invited to the party at least, at least at the beginning as you're getting established. Um, yep. Shane, I, I wondered if you could follow up a little bit with what some approaches are for managing invasive species. Sorry, yeah, non-native no, plants. Non-native plants, right. Um, absolutely, Steve said, said it all very well. Um, and the, the first thing that I recommend to folks is, is monitor those areas for um, new invasion. So if you, um, if you can identify and uh, treat those non-native invasions early, one, it's a lot less work um, and it's uh, much, much easier and you can prevent the problem in the first place. Um, and, you know, always, every time I'm out on a property, if I find one little china berry, um, you can bet there's a big one somewhere close by. Um, those seeds came from somewhere. So uh, if you find one, start to look around and you'll start to find more. And, and again, if you can treat it early, like with a lot of problems, uh, then uh, it's much, much less work. Um, much less expensive 
Uh, a lot of these non-native plants are, are root sprouters. They do require um, some sort of herbicide treatment. Um, and so you wanna be careful about your selection of herbicides. Use, especially if they're standing water, use herbicides that are approved for aquatic use. Um, we always try to approach it um, with uh, minimal use herbicides, so cut stump techniques where you're cutting the plant and only applying herbicide to that cut stump really reduces the amount of herbicides you need. You don't have to go in there and spray large volumes to kill these things. Very targeted, very focused treatments. Um, that's the best way to approach it. It is more labor intensive, but again, you wanna do this in stages anyway. If you come in with big heavy equipment and start to uh, scrape a bunch of vegetation off, as Steve said, that's gonna make the problem worse in a lot of cases, you're gonna lose that stability. And a lot of these plants thrive on disturbance. So these non-native plants love it when you scrape an area clean, they're just gonna come back in and take over very quickly, often uh, at the expense of those native plants. Great, thank you. So I think, yes, a targeted approach. And if they're just here and there, then you know, think about what function they're providing, sure. Um, Brian, I wonder if you could follow up and talk a little bit specifically about Arundo donax, because it is a little bit different than some of the other species that non-native species we see, especially in riparian areas, um, and how, how invasive it can be, um, and then how you might transition from a riparian area dominated by Arundo, a giant cane, to a more uh, functioning and, and native assemblage of plants. Certainly, yeah, and I think um... Steve and Shane really covered, you know, um, from, from, a, from a high level view about, you know, appropriate and thoughtful management of those species and when and how to address those problems, uh, especially monitoring, as, as Shane said, getting those plants out early, uh, that, that, that applies with Arundo as well. Some plants are going to be more aggressive than others. And, you know, certainly if you see something like Chinese tallow starting to come in, you know, I would worry about that a little bit more than I would, uh, you know, some other uh, non-native grasses. Uh, Steve and I have been noticing torpedo grass coming in uh, in certain areas of the hill country, but it seems to spread a little bit more rhizomatically and slowly. Uh, so, you know, we, instead of going in and ripping up that area and destabilizing it, we're just kind of keeping an eye on it and, <laughs> and monitoring it in those locations. But with something like Arundo, uh, when it pops up, uh, if it's a young shoot, you can uh, pull it. Um, if it's not pulling out of the ground easily, uh, then it might require an herbicide treatment. Larger, older stands, um, you know, the most effective mechanism for treating Arundo is using a product, an aquatic approved herbicide uh, and, uh, you know, enlisting the services of a um, licensed applicator that can work in that environment. Uh, it does require in riparian areas a treatment plan to be filed uh, with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife as well. So it really is uh, for older, more established stands, the most effective means of treatment. Uh, at following uh, herbicide treatment, uh, I, I believe it's important to leave it for a couple years standing before removing that dead standing cane because it might not actually be dead. And if you start chopping it up and moving it around, those little fragments, uh, they get deposited on the, uh, on the ground. If uh, there's any viability left in them, they can establish new colonies and you might have exacerbated the problem. So again, it's important to do it methodically. Uh, mechanical removal is possible for, uh, for areas if you're averse to um, uh, the use of, uh, uh, of herbicides. Um, but you, again, do have to be extremely careful that you're doing it in, in a thoughtful way uh, where you are not actually uh, fragmenting and broadcasting uh, that, um, that species. And also I would uh, avoid mechanical removal if you are uh, close to um, uh, the riverbank in an area that can be easily destabilized because you, you might uh, cause uh, you know, more destabil destabilization than you're adding uh, functional benefit. Um, so you know, that's uh, pretty much you know, the, the basics around it. We do have programs in your area, Terra's area through uh, Upper Guadalupe River Authority in Kerr County to treat Arundo. Uh, we've got active programs on the Blanco and, and Pedernales to treat at no cost for landowners through the Healthy Creeks Initiative. And you can contact me for more information if you're in those watersheds. Uh, we, can, uh, we can get you some information on managing a rundo. Um, also, if, if that, that dead standing cane also does create kind of a cage for new native plant growth. Uh, so that's uh, kind of like the cedar slash that we mentioned earlier. It can help uh, prevent and deter browsing. 
Great, thank you. And Ryan mentioned some of the, the partners that are involved in Parks and Wildlife's Healthy Creeks Initiative and the Upper Guadalupe River Basin and the Blanco and the Pernalis. And I know we also have a couple of Bandera folks on here. So the Bandera River Authority and Groundwater District is also a partner in that program as well. Yep, so if um, you're a some, engineer in that area, you know, get in touch with us. Yes. Um, some people just were unsure about where to start. What, where do I start? What is the first step for a homeowner can take to establish a properly functioning riparian area. And we can kind of maybe look at this from the standpoint of, of maybe transitioning from a very manicured, um, more landscaped riparian area to uh, more one that has more function and more benefit to the river. And we brainstormed a bit about these questions and Steve had a great quote, I thought, um, when we talked about this one, he said the best functioning riparian areas are wild and woolly. And I just really love that description. Um, so Ryan, since you're already, um, you can, why don't you take a stab at that one first, like for first steps, and then we can go to Steve or some of our other speakers too. Well, when we talk about, um, you know, management of riparian areas, we always talk about uh, functions and values. And I think it's important to uh, establish what your values for the landscape are, uh, recognizing that wild and woolly, as Steve said, are going to produce uh, the most uh, values as far as you know water storage, water quality, forage for fish and wildlife, habitat, all of those things we think of, of, of the functions of, of riparian areas. But we also recognize that a lot of these areas, you know, people live at the river because they want to use and enjoy it uh, or, or have it be part of their productive landscape. So, um, you know, we just, Shane is going to talk a little bit later about targeted access. So I'll kind of leave that uh, portion of it, but really at, for, for him later, but, um, you know, really establishing what your use and values are and then finding a way where you can uh, accommodate both of those. Um, so, you know, really uh, just starting by some passive restoration, establishing a grow zone, you know, defining a barrier, uh, how much of your riverfront are you willing to let grow up in native vegetation? Uh, you know, the wider the riparian area is, you know, the farther back it stretches from the riverbank, the more functions it's going to provide. But even if you're only willing to dedicate five feet of, of, of a riparian width, you know, just to see, test the waters and see if this is something you can, uh, you know, live with, it's going to be begin to provide some stabilizing functions. So, um, you know, to find that barrier, uh, especially if you have, um, you know, someone else conducting the maintenance on your property, if you have a, a service person coming to mow, um, or if uh, you've got a property owners association where, you know, you know, people might be sharing in those responsibilities, it's important to define the edge of that uh, uh, grow zone. And that can be done with periodic signage along the edge, or it can be something as simple as laying out some cedar logs, uh, you know, along that boundary and it creates a visual boundary. Um, and then it also communicates that you are doing something active. You're not just neglecting to mow this, you are uh, actively restoring this area. So those are just kind of some of the first steps in letting nature do the work. If you want to get there a little bit quicker, then that's what the video was about today, you know, jumping, jump starting the process through uh, some plant installations. Um, so really that's the, you know, the beginning of it, just deciding what you can live with uh, and how much you can dedicate and then uh, establishing boundary and letting, letting nature start take its course and monitoring for invasives, uh, like Shane said, to get them early. Great, thank you. Would anybody else like to, to add anything? Uh, the only thing I would add is, you know, many of the homeowners along the Hill Country riparian areas uh, are some newer residents and they may have moved to the Hill Country from uh, where they lived and their whole life and raised their kids and now they retire or end up on a river area somewhere. And the temptation is we to bring our urban landscape expectations to the riverside. And that's usually a mistake. We don't want to try to mimic an urban landscape on the riverside. Instead, we want to be able to appreciate the beauty of what a high functioning riparian area is and be proud of a, what a wild and woolly uh, riparian area is. And it's beautiful in its own way. And that doesn't mean that there can be no access. It just means that you're very thoughtful and restrictive in what you do. And you're not mowing it like you did your yard in 
in in town and so a, just a different appreciation of what's natural what's beautiful what's functional what is what does it mean to be a good riparian neighbor and manicured landscapes are not part of that so it's a change of mindset in learning to um, live in the river setting uh, like a good river neighbor Great, thank you. Daniel, go right ahead. Sure, so just to, to underscore an idea that we talked about earlier, as far as where you're starting, again, understanding, you know, what are your values, as Ryan said, appreciating function. Steve mentioned having the right mindset. And again, before you start investing lots of money in, say, plantings, thinking about what are those stressors? Steve called them, what are those hindrances to recovery? Perhaps, um, it's excessive mowing, perhaps there's too many native whitetail or exotic axis out there, uh, perhaps there's too much foot traffic or vehicular use, whatever those stressors might be, until you're managing those thoughtfully and effectively, you know, you can plant all day and night, but if you're not managing those stressors or those hindrances, you're not gonna see the recovery you want. So that's another important aspect to consider um, early in the journey. Great, thank you. If um, I can add one more uh, thing to that, you know, we, we are focusing as far as the hindrance in this example as being a, a more uh, residential type environment uh, where, where mowing might be uh, the stressor, but you know, the, the landscape that we're you know, conducting these plantings on is more of a, a rural ranching environment, but you know, the same concepts hold if it's, uh, you know, if the disturbance is excessive cattle, removing them temporarily to allow jump starting of the vegetative regrowth till they might be able to tolerate return to those cattle in a more rotational type of fashion, just not, not allowing unfettered access. So you can utilize cross fencing, fencing out the riparian area. Again, how wide that is, you know, might be uh, something that needs to be considered on a case by case basis. The wider it is, the more function. But then if you do return cattle, returning them in a manner that's more rotational and providing, uh, you know, some alternative water sources in upland areas, um, you know, uh, might be something that you can consider. If it's, if it's uh, farming, you know, uh, again, same thing, just adding a buffer and not plowing so close. So in, in town, we might have mechanical mowers that provide that. On a, a ranch, or we might have cattle. What are some other of our, our mower examples um, besides cattle that you might find out on a ranch? I guess I meant axis deer or other, maybe other, other deer that might be grazing an area. Yeah, so we talked about axis deer. Steve mentioned Audad earlier. Uh, we haven't talked about feral hogs, but there are plenty of introduced ungulates, um, as well as an overabundance of native white-tailed deer that are definitely having impacts on the, the diversity and abundance of our riparian uh, plant communities on many hill country, creeks and rivers. Okay, uh, there was a couple of questions about preventing erosion. So one landowner asked uh, what grasses might be best to prevent erosion. Um, and another mentioned that they have a thick and healthy growth of both switchgrass and eastern gamma grass, but they still have erosion along a sandy loam stretch of the river. And so maybe would there be something you know targeted for that area? So um, just jump on in whoever would like to field that question. Well, I guess just a, the general, the generic answer is uh, do whatever you can to promote vegetation. And that sounds overly simple, but that's really the solution to uh, erosion in a riparian area. So seeding, transplanting, uh, reducing the number of axis or whitetail, restricting grazing. And it, we've, we've almost always been amazed at how quickly these areas heal up once those hindrances and stressors have been have been recognized and uh, and once management starts it's 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 unbelievable how quickly uh, things heal up so it does take some patience uh, droughts can be a challenging time um, but just I think just do just keep doing the things that you've learned about and and most of the time we're very pleased with the outcome. 
for some of those sandy areas too, you know, I think one one thing we didn't touch on today, but we we typically do in in other workshops is the the importance of woody material within the creek. Uh, you know, that can help trap sediment, slow down flows in that area, and let vegetation become uh, more established. So not only you know we talked about cedar slash kind of up on the terrace, but you know wood in the creek uh, in the river itself is is valuable at um, uh, protecting. Um, you know, the establishment of vegetation as well. Yes, that's great to mention. I think that's also part of that, that balance between function and between your use of the river. So if a flood has washed in woody debris into your swimming hole, then, you know, maybe some effort is spent to, to relocate that, but not through your whole river section. That's good. Um, Sorry, the only other thing I'd add is it, it, obviously there's lots of um, different situations. The one other thing and in, in any given case, maybe what's going on upstream as well. Um, you know, your, your section of the creek of the river is not an island. It's influenced by everything that happens above it. And so, you know, the installation of a dam upstream, which changes the gradient of the channel and increases energy, those can have effects on your section as well. So there may be some things it may be the, the um, um, different management just upstream, even if it's not a, a physical barrier like a dam um, that influences the amount of energy coming into your section. So um, that's where uh, working together with your um, neighboring landowners up and downstream can have an impact as well and, and, and magnify the impacts that you're having um, on that area. I think that's a, a great important point and putting that in perspective, you can really only control you know, or manage what's within your control. And, uh, you know, these are not isolated systems. Um, but to the extent that you can add diversity of vegetation, uh, you know, more vigor, um, you know, uh, uh, different plant types, you know, woody species, all, all these concepts we've been talking about might not be able to completely prevent and restore uh, your section of the creek, but it will make it more resilient. Um, so it, it's a great point, Shane. Great. Um, some of the questions I think would be great follow-ups, um, some that I've seen come in to Shane's presentation. So we'll just take maybe one more here and then um, we're going to, we're going to um, lead in with Shane. So Steve, you mentioned drought years. So are there any additional management considerations that we should have during drought years? I don't think you do anything different. Obviously we can't control whether it's wet or dry, but remember that these riparian areas have a water table. And so it's not gonna be as dry as what you may think. If you're up on the hills, yes, it's dry and all the plant life suffers. But down in the riparian area, if it's a seasonal or perennial creek, you've got this water table under your feet. And once those roots get established, at least well enough to access that, they continue to grow in drought and it, it's, it's ironic and it's counterintuitive, but riparian areas can actually heal up sometimes faster in a drought. And the reason is you don't have those currents in that water ripping plants out. You don't have these little pulses of flood water coming through uh, in a drought, but instead the, the actual river or creek bed, uh, as we saw on, on the videos today, you have a dry channel that's providing a place for plants to actually encroach into the channel. And we want that to happen. We want plants to encroach from the water's edge down into the channel because they're providing the roots underneath the bed to strengthen those gravels and then uh, helping to dissipate energy, trap more sediment. And so we can, we've seen some very impressive healing take place even during a drought. And so the message is that droughts don't have the same impact on the riparian area as they do on uplands. It can actually be a time of healing. Excellent, thank you. And I'm just gonna do one more quick one before we go to Shane. We've had a couple of questions about sycamores in particular. I know we're stressing a lot, like health is, one of the definitions of health of riparian area is diversity of plants. 
And so some folks have wondered if I have, um, you know, it seems like I have so many sycamores that are in my riparian area and along the river, you know, is there, is there too many? Um, should you do anything about it? Um, Well, in the case of sycamore, I would say let them grow. Let those thick, thick sycamores grow. They're going to thin out naturally over time. Uh, so if, they're, if you have sycamores every six inches or every foot, and you're thinking to yourself, there's too much sycamore here, I need to thin it out. I would say don't bother, Wait, don't waste your energy. They're going to thin out on their own, but for that time, they need that density for more roots and more energy dissipation. Now, we also get the question of what about when ash juniper or cedar is growing right down close to the riparian area? And there can be a, a, a case to be made for thinning, not total removal, but thinning of juniper with hand cutting, but only if by your thinning of cedar, you're going to benefit a nearby button bush or willow or a sycamore. So if you have plants that are being encroached upon by cedar, you can individually thin out that cedar uh, one plant at a time and each with a making a decision. If I cut this plant, is it going to allow something else to grow? So there's a place for some thinning and some manipulation, but for native plants like, uh, you know, sycamore that we've talked about, uh, I would say usually not beneficial to try to thin those out. They'll thin out naturally on their own. If I might add to that, um, it, you know, they're one of the few things that's gonna grow on these nutrient deprived gravel deposits. So they are going to jumpstart that process and, uh, you know, help provide some shade. Their leaves, uh, you know, they might be completely prolific along this area, but their leaf matter is going to begin that process of adding nutrient matter and material. But they're also going to, uh, I get this question a lot, especially in the Blanco, uh, where, you know, we had completely bare areas after the 2015 flood. And one of the things that does come up is the sycamores. And that is one of the most frequent questions I get. Uh, I want a diversity of trees. What should I do? And uh, if you don't mind sharing uh, my screen one more time, I have an image that I took this summer. Of, yes, go ahead. Uh, I crawled into a one of these um, dense, dense sycamore stands that from the outside looks like nothing but sycamore. But you crawl underneath that and what you see here, there were about a uh, hundred cypress saplings that were protected and being shaded out. And so these are all cypress growing on the inside of what appeared to be a sycamore monoculture. And if you uh, cut back too much, you're going to expose those to browsing. You're gonna expose them to uh, you know, sunlight and wind damage. So there's a lot more going on, you know, just uh, like, uh, like um, Steve said, just be a little bit methodical and, uh, you know, if you do need to open up some lanes to, you know, add uh, diversity in certain areas, do so. But uh, don't, don't take wholesale action against them. Well, that's not that's the opposite. <laughs> so that was the opposite direction. Uh, but this is uh, one of those uh, in the same area, a little bit up closer, what appears to be a sycamore monoculture. But really, in the understory, there's a lot of diversity. This is a naturally recruited, uh, about four to five-year-old, um, cypress tree that came up after the flood. So, um, and you know, we've got Valerie from Tree Folks uh, in the audience as well, and she can attest to that, you know, that, that uh, adding in increased complexity of age classes and structures and diversity will help you get those desirable species that return uh, to, to the landscape. If, if, I, <clears throat> if I can add on, if you've got a lot of sycamore on your stretch of the creek or the river, go out and flag them now while well, they've got their leaves out and they're easy to identify. And then wait a couple months, go take some cuttings and teach your up or downstream neighbor about riparian health and function and, and show them how to do the cuttings method. Excellent, thank you very much. So we're going to have a little bit more time for questions at the very end, um, but Shane, let's, let's hear from you.
How's that look? That looks good and we can All hear right. you. Very good. Um, thanks everybody. Um, wonderful presentations as always. Um, I'm gonna speak really uh, briefly about targeted access and grow zones. Um, this is about how we use these areas, right? We've talked a lot about um, how we restore them um, and improve function. Um, but uh, this uh, section is really about how we can balance um, our, our values, our uses of these areas uh, with those functions. All right, and so uh, what we're talking about here are the values that we see, the reasons that we want to live and own land along these riparian areas. An obvious one is that production value, right? Riparian areas produce uh, lots of forage um, and often reliable water for livestock. Um, this is a good example of, of the value um, that we want from a riparian area that's dependent on function. If we overuse that forage um, in time, uh, that value is going to decrease. We're not going to have the abundant um, forage for livestock to utilize if we're not managing it properly. Uh, and so the same thing goes for recreational values. Um, good fishing requires good fish habitat that's dependent on riparian function. A wildlife viewing depends on good wildlife habitat. That depends on good healthy riparian function. Swimming in clean water uh, depends on good healthy riparian function. And all of these things um, necessitate access to or near the water. That's why we own land along them. We want to be able to get to the water um, or at least close to it to enjoy these things. Uh, the functions here, these are the things that we've been talking about all along um, and uh, you've heard in, in these workshops. And all of these functions, as Steve said, are dependent on tall abundant vegetation. Uh, and so the conflict here is that tall and abundant vegetation often inhibits access. It makes it hard to get to these areas and, and use them in the manner we, we might want to. So I've used this picture a lot. You may have seen it um, in a talk if you've, if you've listened to me before. Uh, it's an excellent example of a healthy and functional riparian area. It is wild and woolly, um, as Steve says. Uh, but if I'm talking to you about how you can get enjoyment out of your um, riparian area, um, Many people would look at this and go, well, that's great. Looks like excellent wildlife habitat. I understand that it's functional, but I can't use it. I can't get to it. Um, and so again, here we're looking for that balance. Um, how do we provide ourselves access um, for these, these values while maintaining as much function as possible, All right? This is one way to do it, um, except this maximizes that access value, right? Um, this, I can get down to any, any point along this, uh, any point along this stream that I want. I don't have to worry about stepping on or seeing a snake. I don't have to worry about chiggers or ticks. Um, I've got all the access I want, but I've eliminated virtually all of the function. Um, so this is, this is what we're trying to avoid here. And unfortunately, this is, this is common. Um, I see this frequently. This is, this is a landowner going in and cleaning up that creek um, so that they can see it and get access to it. Um, but what a lot of folks uh, don't realize is that they're, they're eliminating all the functional value of these riparian areas and really reducing uh, a lot of the values that they want to see. Wildlife habitat, clean water, abundant water, all those things are reduced. And very little grazable uh, use down here as well. And so this is not what we're looking for. Um, so we're looking for that balance again. Um, and I've got a picture of a boat ramp here. I thought that was a, a really good example of targeted access um, for a, a few reasons. Everybody appreciates a boat ramp. It gives you access to get your boat in the water so you can go fishing or boating, whatever it may be. And I think that if you'd ask a fisherman, um, hey, instead of this boat ramp, we're gonna make access um, a lot better. You're not gonna have to wait in the lines anymore because we're just gonna pave the entire uh, bank so that you can put your boat in wherever you want. Um, those fishermen would think you're crazy because that shoreline habitat is fish habitat. That's where they're fishing, fish along shoreline. And so that boat ramp provides very targeted access while preserving function along the rest of the bank. And I put this sign here to remind me something that uh, Ryan already said, which is signage uh, or some sort of delineation of these areas. And it's important for two reasons, and, and he mentioned these, uh, both of them. 
Uh, one is to keep you from accidentally encroaching upon um, your grow zones, your naturally vegetated areas um, accidentally uh, when you're mowing or doing other sort of maintenance things. And the other reason is in a community setting, a park or a, uh, maybe a shared section of river with a property owners association, it indicates that it's intentional. Um, it indicates that the area is important, that you did this for a reason. You didn't just um, leave it alone because the tractor ran out of gas and you were too lazy to go back and, and finish. It's there for a purpose. It indicates the importance of these areas. And so signage or, um, as, as Ryan said, just lining it with uh, cedar posts, something to separate that area um, and indicate its importance to everybody that may see it and to remind you of what you're doing. These, the rest of these are just quick examples to give you some pictures in your mind. This is a simple, these access points and grow zones can be, uh, take any number of forms. Uh, this is quick temporary access. This was done simply, the landowner did this quickly so that we could get access down to the creek well, so we could see it on the site visit. It wasn't something permanent, it was quick, easy, um, a weed eater and a few minutes and you've got some temporary access uh, down to this riparian area. Uh, very quick, low maintenance, um, not a permanent solution for access, but something that works quickly. You may have an area that you want to use more frequently, a stone patio, sitting area so you can see the water, watch wildlife, enjoy it, but just like you wouldn't line the entire uh, riparian area with a stone patio, um, you don't need to mow or remove large dead woody material all along that riparian area either. I've got um, very good access here. It's clean, it's safe. Um, I can get to the area to recreate, uh, but I've left a lot of the function um, in this riparian area intact. Access for swimming. Um, you don't have to reshake the bank so that you can you know, walk carefully into the water. Ladders can work well. Uh, to uh, provide access for swimming here off again off the stone patio. While most of the bank is left intact, I can still get access to my swimming hole uh, for recreation. I like this example a lot um, from Daniel. This one um, is nice because it, the access actually um, helps replace some of the function, right? These stone steps will provide some erosion control um, in, a, in, in, in place of the vegetation that I had to remove to put them in. This one's also important because here we've got the natural vegetation and my access point working together. If you were to remove all of that vegetation on either side of those steps, what you'd find over time is that you're gonna to start to see erosion along the sides of those steps. I've seen this in many cases where a man-made structure um, is put in and then vegetation isn't allowed to uh, grow around it. And you're going to start to see erosion of that bank along it because this little section stabilized, that water is going to find a weak point to work on. And so maintaining the function of this vegetation around my access point uh, becomes all the more important. You may need a slightly larger area to work on. You may need a large area for playing sports, for large community gatherings. Um, this is a pretty substantial uh, manicured area, but a solid buffer has been left between the bank and the area that uh, that's in use here. I've got access um, for boating or fishing down here to the lower right. I've got an area to recreate um, up above on the bench uh, behind my grow zone here. Uh, and so I, I've got the best of both worlds. I've got my access, but I haven't eliminated that function um, completely. Um, the obvious question is going to be, well, how much, how, how wide an area that's been touched on a little bit, Ryan said, even, even five feet, um, and, and he's absolutely right. Um, so the simple answer is as much as you can. Um, leave as wide an area as you can. The wider, um, the better. But I try to get people thinking about uh, 30 feet's a good general rule, and there's lots of factors that may play into whether it's more or a little less, but 30 feet's a great rule to start with. If you can get by with 30 feet, if you can stand that, that's a really good place to start. If it needs to be a little less, say five to 10 feet, that's better than nothing. That's better than mowing down to the water's edge. And uh, this is the last example here. Um, and this is a good one. This is a little different because 
I don't have access to the water necessarily, but maybe I don't need it here. Maybe I've got a swimming hole downstream and I've got access to swim down there. This is just a camping picnic area. Um, the entire bank has been left intact uh, to provide as much function as possible. And what I really want you to look at here, look at that opposite bank across the river. That's a very different management strategy, right? Um, no buffer, um, no grow zone along that bank. And I want you to think about whether that side of the river really offers me that much more recreational value. What value do I get out of that opposite side that I don't have over here um, where we're standing? And where we're standing, it's got a lot more natural function. It's gonna be a lot healthier um, and it's gonna be a lot more stable uh, in the long run. And that's all I've got. Um, Tara, I will turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. There were a couple of questions that have come in that I thought would be a good follow-up to your presentation, so I'll, I'll ask them to Shane. Um, one was just about the, the signs, the grow zone signs, if there is a common um, place to purchase them or if somebody, if there's any partners on this call that sell them um, or if you just kind of make your own and have it printed. Yeah, it does not. I used a, a rather fancy example from the city of Austin um, in that presentation. They do not need to be. Um, you know, they can be hand painted signs, grow zone, um, uh, don't mow here. Um, anything works, and it, it doesn't even have to be a sign, as Ryan pointed out, just something to delineate that area. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there are commercially um, uh, available ones. I don't know any offhand. Okay. Uh, because what I'll often recommend to folks is just um, anything, if it's, if it's my personal property, anything I can put up to remind me, um, it may be a small rock cairn um, or a cedar post, that just tells me this area is special, this area is different. Um, Hand-painted signs are great. Um, I encourage humor um, in them uh, as well. That's always good. Uh, and um, so, yeah, anything to keep you separate. If it's a community shared area, you may, you certainly may want to include some educational signage. Why is this grow zone important? Those sorts of things. And that's kind of what that city of Austin sign gets at uh, that you might use in a, in a little more of a community setting um, to provide some um, interpretation and education as well. Great. So again, really thinking about how you're using the area and what's the message that you want to get across and probably a, a there's not a one size fit all approach. So be good to develop those for your specific area. Um, this is following up a little bit on, you said about shared riverfront areas and we were talking about maybe a homeowners association. Is there um, assistance or resources, you know, that could come and talk at an HOA meeting or to kind of get people a mini version of what we're talking about today, but specifically about how maybe that association could start to implement a grow zone or could, um, improve how they're managing the riparian area. Absolutely. I, I think you'd find that um, any of the folks, uh, any of the presenters here today um, would uh, jump at the opportunity to do that, um, especially a group of landowners um, and provide that uh, hands-on education. Um, um, it's something we do uh, all the time. Uh, I know Ryan and, and um, Steve in his retirement um, does, uh, <laughs> does a lot of, of uh, education like that as well. And, and that's part of what we're all um, here to do is spread that message um, and um, find interested parties, right? If you've, if you've got folks that are interested, that's the audience that any one of us would want to be uh, in front of. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and several have asked about, and so we're, I will send out a wrap-up email that will reiterate everybody's contact information so you have that. And some have asked about having access to the presenter's slides and information. And, you know, I'll just check with everyone individually, but usually that's something, yes, we can do very easily as well. So we'll, we'll send you a good, a good resource packet afterward. All right, Mr. Daniel, do you want to um, wrap us up? And we will also have a chance afterwards to take additional questions. Sure. Um, so again, thanks everybody for joining us. Sorry we weren't able to take you down to the creek banks at Roberts Ranch today. But again, as, as we started the day, I want to remind you that this is not the end. This is an ongoing effort to build relationships, landowner to landowner, landowner to practitioners. And so as Tara just mentioned, we're going to send you some follow-up information including the, the riparian planting guide referenced in the video, 
that distills the different planting techniques. We hope that you'll get out uh, this week and this weekend, walk the site, think about these ideas of riparian health and function, consider the stressors or what hindrances to recovery uh, are at play and how you could perhaps manage them. As Shane said earlier, keep an eye out and try to do some early detection of some of those non-native plants. If you're interested in cuttings, now is the right time to go and flag them while they still have their leaves. Uh, once those leaves have dropped, you can get out there and, um, and put them in the ground this winter. Talk with your neighbors, share what you've learned. And um, again, thanks for, for joining us this morning and for all your stewardship. We really appreciate it and we enjoy working with you. So please don't be shy. Reach out to Tara, to Shane, to Steve, to Ryan and myself. If you have any questions, we're here to support you. So again, thanks. Thanks a whole bunch. Okay. Um, and is that, that's all you had, Daniel? Yeah, and just, you off. You know, okay. in a few months, we'll send out a survey to everyone just to, to check in and, and see ultimately, were we effective in supporting you? So expect in a few months, a survey from us, really just to see, were we effective? How can we do better in supporting landowners uh, such as yourselves? Because we'd like to continue to use this model in other river basins in the Hill Country. So be on the lookout for that survey. and. And don't be shy, reach out if you have any questions in the meantime. Great. And, and Daniel and I have talked too about how we might continue this. So we, we started a, a partnership with all of you back in November and we met again in February. And so we're going to continue to discuss that and, and hope to keep reaching out via email um, to, to keep building those relationships. So I'm we have some more time for questions and we have a few more. So I'm going to keep fielding questions if that works for everybody. Um, okay. One was about how do I convince my neighbors not to mow? And, you know, I don't think that they're, I'll maybe try to give a stab at that one and, and then please also jump in. You know, I don't think that there's, there's no magic sentence that you can say that's going to automatically convince them, but often found that instead of saying, you know, mowing is bad because X, Y, and Z, you know, start to present what the positives are that if you enjoy having that beautiful, crystal clear, flowing hill country stream that stays flowing during droughts, you know, that is achieved through having a healthy riparian area and having a area along the creeks and streams that's holding on to water all throughout the year and then slowly releasing it back into this, this stream when it's not raining. And in order to achieve that, you know, having a diverse, um, area of many different kinds of vegetation, you know, a thick, a, as wide of a buffer as you can manage is beneficial. And so maybe going at trying to convince them about um, what the benefits would be to having to not mowing and to help that area grow up and possibly, I think that the, the videos that were put together after the Blanco flood, which I have links to them in the, our riparian section on UGRA's page. And I think I'll add some of those other, uh, some of those resources in the follow-up email as well. It really shows quite a contrast between the damage that was um, received on the properties that had a, um, maybe that their, their areas were maintained in more of that urban mindset, uh, more traditional mode landscaping compared to those that had natural riparian areas. Um, and Steve showed a picture of an area along the Blanco um, that had started to, that just, you know, weeks after the flood was, was well on its way to recovery and had minimal damage. So that would be my advice for trying to convince them. If anybody else wants to jump in, that's fine. And we can move on to the next question too. Yeah, I'll just tack onto what Shane was talking about with signage, you know, the, 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 the messaging, if you do put signage up kind of at the edge where your neighbors or the public or at a roadside, you know, uh, if, if you're close to a, a road where people can see that is to keep the messaging positive, uh, you know, uh, and just like you said, Tara, uh, not no mow zone, but this is a grow zone, just showing people that you're not neglecting it, but that it's uh, an active restoration area. At the end of the video, we saw that grow zone, ecological restoration in progress. Um, you know, I'll show one more photo here. Um, that's this uh, nice restoration area, I know with a trail and the river down there, and there's a sign that just says restoration area, give nature a chance, you know, so 
it's just positive messaging, I think, is the important and keeping up those relationships uh, with your neighbors. And, you know, if, if, if you go so far as to, you know, share a gift of the resource of something like the um, Remarkable Riparian book, you know, that's an attractive uh, product that, you know, is almost like a coffee table book and can present that information in a, in a way that's, um, you know, shows that these areas, uh, you know, can be, can be beautiful in their own way. And uh, so Ryan and Shane and, and Steve and I, whenever we go and meet with a landowner, we always ask them, what are their goals? What are their values for their land? And often by having that conversation, that informs how we meet them where they're at, how we connect with them, what is our messaging to, to connect with them. So I would encourage folks to, to have those open conversations with your neighbors to explore, you know, how they love and enjoy and take care of their land and, and, and speaking to their values. Because as especially Shane and Steve demonstrated, without the function, you can't have all those values. But people typically orient around the values first and so that's where I usually start the conversation. Great. And someone also said through the chat too, invite, if you're a master naturalist, invite your neighbor to, to come to the meetings or to maybe take the master naturalist course because education is a great, is kind of just a natural lead into those change in, in management. I'll, yeah, I'll add one really quick point to that too, is that, you know, targeting non-traditional groups, you know, to, to do that. Like, like you just said, we, uh, I had an interesting event uh, at a riparian area, it was the uh, the Wimmerly Garden Club. Uh, so you know, it's traditionally focused on more manicured landscape uh, type environments within uh, within the community, and they do tours. But we had one out at a riparian demonstration site, and we got to talk about the functions and values of native vegetation, and you know, show them the native uh, wildflowers and, and functions and stuff like that. So we saw a lot of light bulbs turn on within that within that uh, community of of people. So yeah, keep that keep that dialogue going. Great. And I'll, I'll, okay. I'll add just because no one else has, um, you can always appeal to their natural laziness as well, right? Um, if you tell folks, hey, I can cut your mowing down uh, by three quarters um, and uh, you'll have a, a healthier, more functional riparian area, uh, they might jump at that. Um, if they're out in the middle of the summer mowing in the hot sun, uh, go sit in the shade where they can see you and sip a cool drink and, and explain how they can have that uh, extra recreational time uh, as well. So uh, that's always a, a, maybe a last resort, but uh, that's always a good one. Uh, works sometimes. Great. Um, there were some questions about timing of seeding. So the, there's different places where you can purchase, you know, riparian grass seed mix, um, Native American seed injunction is one of them. I believe there's others. And so when is the best time to put that seed out? Uh, for grass is typically in the cool season, uh, you know, late winter. Uh, so January, January, February, March, um, it's going to be when, you know, kind of mimicking that natural germination cycle. Uh, but then there's other, uh, you know, other ones that, uh, like, um, <clears throat> winter grasses that might be seeded a little bit earlier in the year, earlier in the year, like, um, inland sea oats or Virginia wild rye or bristle grass that, um, might be something that you, you seed in the, in the earlier fall. Okay, and one of the resources that Hill Country Alliance has put together that will also send a link out to, um, and I think Daniel mentioned it, it has a list of, um, of, of places to work, nurseries that we can purchase riparian plants um, and also seeds. And Daniel, is that, please correct me if I just butchered that, but I believe that the publication contains that information. Yes, um, this resource that we'll share includes not only the, the cliff notes of, of how to implement the different planting methods, but also some, certainly not all, but some of the sources for finding these native plant materials. Great. Um, you know, we were talking about some of those iconic views of hill country streams, you know, clear, fast flowing, and cypress trees are definitely a part of that, but we often see um, maybe a cypress tree just kind of out there on its own trying to hold in a whole bank together and might have very um, landscaped grasses or just turf grasses that are surrounding it. So if you love your cypress trees and you want them to stay there for, for many, many years to come, what would be kind of a targeted approach of planting or seeding um, 
in addition to, to just discontinuing mowing in those areas that could really help those cypress trees to support the, the bank and prevent erosion around their roots. One of the things that was so destructive about the Blanco flood was that there were plenty of old, old, mature cypress. And they're so rigid and they were so tall that the leverage of the current broke them or uprooted them. But on those tracks that had smaller, younger cypress, they were still flexible enough that they bent over and they didn't usually uproot. So the lesson there is that we need multiple age classes. Everybody loves the big, old, mature, grand cypress, but we also need baby cypress, teenage cypress, and young cypress. We need at least three different age classes. They need to be constantly reproducing, and some of those need to be, you know, escaping uh, the deer and livestock grazing. And so look for a diversity of ages and look for undergrowth of other species. This is where the rough leaf dogwood, the possum haw, some of the secondary species that grow, we call them understory plants. Again, it goes back to diversity. And we want some of these, some of these don't grow into big grand trees. They stay as, well, the crude term is underbrush, but uh, shrubs, and small trees that grow underneath the canopy. Those are really just as important and they dissipate energy. And as a bonus, most of them have good berries for birds, provide good habitat. So we wanna get our mind off of just those grand beautiful cypress and also uh, other species of shrubs and trees and make sure they're reproducing. Great, thank you. Um, and also kind of continuing with the, the flooding question, um, you know, we just had, and, and I think we've mostly answered this, you know, how, what should we do after a flood to prevent further erosion or damage or to how to make your, your waterfront more, more flood resistant? And I think it's, it's just what Steve said, diversity and diversity of not just species, but of age classes as well. And keeping that, that um, grow zone area as thick as possible, as deep as possible. You know, maybe Shane gave a great um, goal of 30 feet. Um, and so just as much as you can. And also the follow-up is there's gonna be a time of mourning. After a flood, it's, it's very depressing to go back and look at what you used to have. And now it's been, it's been taken away. And it, it's literally a time of mourning. You've lost something that was dear to you, but don't go in there immediately and try to clean it up. Don't go in there with the tractors and the big equipment and say, I'm gonna clean this up. Let it be wild and woolly for a while. Let the, leave those logs, take pictures. Take pictures of the destruction and how bad it looks. And then go back and take those same pictures in a few months the next season, the next year, and you're going to be amazed at how quickly it wants to come back if we don't go in there and wholesale clean up everything. So let it look a little bit uh, ragged for a while. That's nature's way of healing up, and especially the woody debris, which provides niches for all of these plants to start growing. And this is Daniel. I forgot to mention this earlier, but we do hope to get everyone out to uh, YMCA Roberts range perhaps next year so we can continue to stay engaged and see how that system is recovering. So sorry I failed to mention that before, but we do hope to get y'all out there uh, once it's appropriate to get 50, 60 folks together. So sorry for, sorry Tara, I forgot to mention that earlier. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have just one more question and it is for folks in from someone in the Frio River watershed. So are there any local resources or who should people in the Frio River watershed contact that maybe want to have a site visit or just talk with a local resource about riparian area management? Um, I'd be happy to start a conversation with them. And then, you know, my, my area of, uh, for parks and wildlife is to, uh, of my area of service is the Texas Hill Country. So it's a pretty broad geographic area. 
Um, but if uh, you, we can at least start the conversation, I can try and align them with uh, you know the, the right contacts or or myself come out for a, a site visit. Uh, my colleague Megan Bean might also be able to if the scheduling works better because she's at a little closer out of Kerrville, but mostly works in the Trans Pecos. So um, you know just. Uh, email uh, me and we can get that going. Uh, also, uh, New Oasis River Authority is a great uh, resource. Sky Louie out there is, you know, uh, along with Steve, been one of the, the greatest champions for riparian restoration in uh, Texas. Um, so, you know, really, you know, some of our earliest champions of that. So uh, you do have some good resources out there. Uh, you know, it might be a, a local wildlife biologist or myself or Texas Forest Service or, or the Nueces River Authority, but just uh, email me and we'll, we'll get you started off on the right track. And um, yeah, Daniel uh, might have additional resources, uh, Shane, you know, other pro private wildlife biologists. Um, there's, there's a lot of resources at your disposal. Yeah, we certainly cover um, uh, the Frio River area as well. So happy to help folks out that way. Excellent. Well, I want to say thank you for everybody for joining us today and for your continued work being stewards of our river basins um, in Central Texas. And please look, I will do my best to get this follow up email to you this week. Um, and if you, it will have all of our contact information in there. And all of these folks are wonderfully giving of their time and want to talk to you more about your riparian area management. So definitely reach out with additional questions that you may have. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Thank you.